since it's going to be very obvious what my high is going to be, I think I'll just mention what my low and my act of kindness are. My low is looking back on everything I've seen in the last three years. If someone were to come back from time in the future, and I tell my past self that Amphibia is going, well, actually, I'll save that for the end. There's something I was basically going to tell myself, and if I had listened then, I wouldn't have believed you. And my act of kindness would be that I really would go back and tell myself this particular thing. So, we're finally here. This was the final episode of Amphibia. Good morning and happy Sunday, everyone. So the episode starts off right where you left off. The moon is falling and it turns out the core has one final gambit to eradicate all life in Amphibia as a, as a sort of safeguard of, you know, preserving what it knows. Basically, it could restart anew if it destroys all life in Amphibia. And then, the only way to save the world is if Anne, Sasha, and Marcy unleash the power of the stones and go up and destroy the moon. However, Mother Ohm tells Anne that there actually is a very special spell that you can enchant, you can enchant, or enchant or whatever, that you use the power of all three stones at once, but you use it as a last resort because if you do this, you will die. Now, first of all, the transformation scene in which Anne, Sasha, and Marcy's stone powers are revealed is incredible. These are some of the coolest looking designs I've ever seen for any hero. You know, anime or manga or comic, Marvel, DC, any of that. Like, you saw Anne, Sasha, and Marcy donning this armor and, like, how powerful they look. And you're like, okay, they're going to save the world. And in the beginning, it really does look like they are succeeding. As it turns out, the moon had a whole bunch of um, experiments and robots that were, you know, trying to stop the three girls, but the three girls take them out like that. And so the moon then decides, and then the core makes the moon go faster down into the earth. And so the girls are like trying to push it back, but they're not able to do it. And then King Andreas arrives and he's like, I'm going to do something I should have done long ago or needs to be done. So he has all of his robots that are still remaining and they help Anne, Sasha, and Marcy. And the core is like, what are you doing here? You're something I should have done a long time ago. Stand up to you and bam, he crushes the core or the part of the core that was with, that he always had in his crown. Which that was incredibly cathartic, it was. However, even with the power, even with all the robots and the power of the stones, you know, it's not enough. Especially since Sasha and Marcy are, they don't have as much use or control of the power as Anne does. So that's when Anne does it. She tells him, listen, I will use all the power of the stones combined. It might destroy me though, but it's the only way the world can be saved. 
So Sasha and Marcy go back. Meanwhile, Spree's like, what's going on? Anne is still up there. So Spree gets on Domino 2 and they fly up to where Anne is. And she unleashes like this powerful like beam that just destroys the moon with one shot. And it was wonderful. The world was saved. At a price though, because and then disintegrate into, you know, leaves and starlight dust and stuff or whatever. And everyone is really sad. However, Anne then wakes up on a sort of ethereal plane where she then communicates with this very, very, very powerful watcher-like being who can take the form of anything that, you know, her human mind can, you know, comprehend. So first she takes the form of an old computer and then Domino, her cat Domino. And this, you know, guardian watcher's like, listen, I have been watching over the cosmos for eons and eons. And I really am looking for a replacement, a successor. I want you, Anne, to be that successor. Especially when, because this, this uh, creator was the one who made the stones. And the creator says, in 10,000 years since those stones existed, you're the only one who's ever actually used them for good. You did it to help others, which that's exactly what you did. But then Anne decides to take a refusal because she said so herself. She's just a little kid, 13 years old. You know, for every one good thing I do, I've made dozens of other mistakes. This kind of thing really isn't for me. So this guardian deity is really nice about it. And actually, I should probably point out Whoever the voice of the Guardian is, I know that's one. Of the, that's Ruby from uh, Steven Universe. So uh, I forget. I forget that actress's name. But I know she's also been on SNL. Um, actually, hold on one moment. Sorry, I, I thought I thought I heard something, but it, it was it was nothing, no problem. I thought I thought I heard something, like like people around. It, it's fine. Although if it was like a frog or something, that really would be very fitting considering what I'm talking about right now. Anyway, um, so where was I? So basically, this watcher lets Anne return, and. She also gives Anne three more gemstones, but they're smaller than what the original gemstones were. Basically, Anne, Sasha, and Marcy have enough power for one trip home. And here we get into the title of this episode. Oh, I me. Mean, the title of the episode appeared at the beginning, but this is where I want to talk about the title of the episode. And that is the hardest thing because if there is one thing about life that everyone can agree on it's that it is all but far too short and because of this so many people in our lives come and go And sometimes you're lucky and you see those people again, and that's great. But sadly, this is one instance where that won't be happening again. So, Marcy says goodbye to King Andreas, who has redeemed himself, who, who winds up redeeming himself later, as he works in like fields now. Olivia and Nudan have actually became a couple, which, that's really cool. Marcy says goodbye to them. 
Sasha says goodbye to Grime. And then Anne said goodbye to Hapadaya, Polly, and Sprig Planner. And it was beautiful. It hit all of the right emotional spots for me. And sadly, after they all said their goodbyes, our three girls traveled home. So now the people of Amphibia are wondering, what do they do now? Well, they rebuild. A few years go by, we see Polly a little bit older. Sprig is also a little bit older. And a few things have changed. Grind grew like a, a beard that's like braided. Unan and Olivia are living together as a couple. Hey, listen, this was a very progressive show from the very beginning, okay? Right on. Anyway, um, now I kind of wish that up. Now I kind of wish this episode premiered during June, because June is Pride Month. Anyway, um, and they unveil a statue of Anne, their hero. Like a sword carrying the box, kind of like this or whatever. And it was awesome. And then Ivy shows up and tackles Sprague like she always does, because they're a couple now. And then Ivy says, guess what? There's a brand new continent that hasn't been touched by Frog, Newt, or Toad. Wanna go check it out? And then Anne, or sorry, Sprague remember what Anne told her, told him. He's like, let's do it. Like, he literally looks at the statue, he's like, in his own way, he was kind of saying, Anne, watch over me. And there he goes off in adventure. Meanwhile, in the, in the human world, 10 years have passed. And this is another part of why the title, known as The Hardest Thing, is very fitting for this episode. Because if you remember, Marcy didn't want the girls to be separated because, you know, because she was moving. And sadly, that is what wound up happening. After Marcy left, you know, Anne and Sasha hung out a lot together for a while. But when they got to high school, they sort of fell into different, you know, friend groups, which happens. And it's not like you know, they separated, they, it's not like they weren't, you know, being friends anymore or anything, not at all. Of course they were friends. And of course they still talked. It was just every once in a while. And that's another sad thing about life. You know, I'll never forget, you know, one experience I have, you know, I went to St. Mary our Mother in elementary school and by the time we got to Horace Heads Middle School, everyone I knew started going off to, you know, different groups and stuff. Not that none of us weren't friends anymore, just that's what happened. And even though all three girls did wind up, you know, being separated from one another, it's, they really were never apart. It's implied they still like were communicating with each other over the years. And all three of them are leading very successful lives. I mean, Marcy is now the author of a very popular web comic. Sasha actually has a degree in psychology, you know, helping, uh, you know, helping, you know, youth tackle their problems. And how very fitting that Anne, who started this whole series from basically being a follower and a bit of a troublemaker. You know, she's living a successful life working at the amphibia, amphibian exhibit at the aquarium. Yeah, this, this takes place in like Los Angeles or San Francisco, one of these areas, it's somewhere in California. Actually, this is in, I'm pretty sure this is in Los Angeles. Although, where'd they get that nice bridge from? Because that looked like the Golden Gate Bridge to me. I don't know, just semantics. The point is, yes, the hardest thing about life is change. 
And I just mentioned how things, people, places, they all come and go. But if you hold on a little bit of hope and you keep some positive attitude, it finds a way of coming right back. And the series ends with Anne working in the museum after teaching some little kids about frogs. She actually had a little pink frog, pink, uh, pink uh, tree frog named Sprig. I wonder why. And after the little kids leave, she sees Sasha and Marcy in the distance with Marcy going like. And then Anne runs over and gives them probably one of the greatest hugs I've ever seen in all fiction. And there's a little sprig in the uh, amphibian aquarium museum thing. And then the end. <sighs> 58 episodes. And I watched them all as they premiered, give or take a day or two apart. And that thing I told myself I would go back in time to tell myself three years prior to this moment. I want to preface this by saying, and I've told this story before. When I was in college, Disney had premiered a show called Gravity Falls. Now, I was busy in school and college and, you know, couldn't really watch it, didn't really have access to TV or whatever. And so I missed out on it. Little what I know, I missed out big time. Of course, I, I've seen Gravity Falls since, but, you know, there's a, there's a certain flair to seeing it as it premieres, you know? Although I think I did see the finale when it first aired. Maybe, I forget. But the point is, you know, I missed out on Gravity Falls. And it would have been easy for me to just say, you know, that's it, I'm not gonna have that opportunity again. Little what I know that one of the storyboard artists who worked on Gravity Falls named Matt Brawley was making his own show, Amphibia. I immediately saw the designs, I immediately saw what the story was about, and I told myself, I will not make the same mistake twice. And after three full, after almost three full years, I kept my word. Now, in my entire life, you've probably, you've seen me make a whole bunch of movie and TV show references, doing these videos, all sorts of stuff, or music or whatever. It's pretty obvious. I am, you could call myself, I could call myself a victim, let's say, of, you know, pop culture popularity, you know, I have seen my fair share of movies and television shows that, you know, have always been able to satiate something I'm wanting to see. Like, um, when it comes to, especially with TV shows, when it comes to say, you know, comedy, I'll watch something like Ed and Eddie or Rocco's Modern Life or The Angry Beavers. If I want action, I'll go to Avatar The Last Airbender or Samurai Jack. If I want, say, good music, I'll go to, uh, you know, Steven Universe or Centaur World. Actually, speaking of action, I should also put Kid Cosmic in there, too. Or, you know, drama. Steven Universe is another good one for drama. My point is, I've seen many shows that have again fulfilled my need to be to be entertained for whatever it is I want to be entertained with. 
but never did I ever think, because here's the thing, yes, I have been fully satisfied in every aspect before, but they are really only for movies. You know, you have, you know, Lord of the Rings, Return of the King, or, you know, any of the Avengers movies, or uh, Harry Potter and Deathly Hallows, part two. I make no jokes when I tell you that three years ago, I never would have said what I'm about to say right now. Amphibia is my favorite show of all time. And you heard it here first. It, it just is. It is my favorite show of all time. Because, I mean, yeah, I mean, if I was going with the simple, am I going to give it S tier? Of course I will. I was going to give it an S tier after season two, if we're being honest. But Matt Brawley and his fantastic cast and crew made something truly special. A show that I may never see ever again in the future. I mean, if there's Amphibia reruns, of course I'm going to watch Amphibia the time. Are you kidding me? I love this show. I, I literally just say Amphibia is my favorite show of all time. Of course I'm going to watch it again if it's ever on. Sure. But what I mean is I'm probably never going to see another show that makes me flat out say it's my favorite show of all time. Not like this. So there you have it. From this moment on, and you know what? I'm willing to bet for the rest of my life. If anyone were to ever ask me what my all time favorite show is, it is Amphibia, created by Matt Brawley and produced by Disney. Simple as that. Oh, and by the way, I'm sure a lot of people are probably gonna be really weirded out by the fact that a 32 year old man says that a kid show is his favorite show of all time. May I remind you, Doug Walker, AKA the Nostalgia Critic, was incredibly late to seeing Avatar The Last Airbender. And he was almost 40 when he said that Avatar The Last Airbender was his favorite show of all time. I'm pretty sure I'm gonna be doing, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be fine. So, to Matt Brawley, the good people, who worked with him, be it voiceover actors, cast crew, storyboard artists, everyone at Disney. I am very humbled that I was able to see all 58 episodes of your wonderful show and make this video for me. I mean, I, I, I hope that I, mean, I would like for this video to get to you somehow. That'd be, that'd be really cool if that happened. But again, if it doesn't, who knows? But I am still very humbled I got to see this and share my thoughts with all of you about it today. I am very hopeful that, you know, Matt Brawley and everyone who worked on Amphibia lives happy lives. I mean, Matt Brawley, Matt Brawley even sent a message to all the fans saying like, this was the best three years of his life. No, Matt Brawley. This was the best three years of every single fan of Amphibia's lives. And you created that. So thank you. From the bottom of my heart and probably from the bottom of the hearts of all of your fans, thank you for everything you've done. And I hope that, you know, whatever endeavor you or anyone else who worked with you takes part in is met with nothing but success. Thank you and have a nice day.